Well, this week is a week of Thanksgiving. It's a national holiday in which we stop and give thanks to the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking that you don't have a lot to give thanks for in this season. You know, I've found that one of the worst games that we can get into is the comparison game. And it's really easy to get into to compare ourselves with other people. And when we do, it almost always gives us a, a false sense of reality. Here's what happens when we begin to compare ourselves. We always find the most extreme examples and then compare ourselves. I saw a television interview about a young couple in California and they had, by their 30s, amassed about $2 million in wealth. And in this interview, uh, they were talking to this person who was working about 60 hours a week. And they said, they said what, are you, what are you working for? And he said, I'm, I'm trying to make it. And the interviewer said, with a net worth of $2 million, what are you trying to make it to? He's comparing himself with other people who had more. And that's what happens is we find the most extreme examples. We compare ourselves with others who have more, and we feel like there's, there's something wrong with us. We also compare ourselves with people that don't exist. There's a lot of people that from the outside, it looks like they don't have any problems, and, and, and everything is all together in their life. And I've pastored long enough and done counseling long enough to know that some of the best looking couples that look like they just have the perfect life and everything is together when they come into my office and begin to talk about their problems and what's going on at home what you see on the outside is very different from the reality on the inside we find ourselves comparing ourselves with people who simply don't even exist one day i was sitting at home it was a friday in atlanta it was my day off i'd been cleaning the house and doing some things and i get a text from a lady and this text says, have you ever done anything spontaneous and just special for Suzanne? And I knew her and her family well enough to know where all this was going. And I said, yes, and I gave her a little example and I texted her back and I said, but you cannot compare my strengths with your husband's weaknesses. It's an, it's an unfair comparison. And that's what we do, isn't it? I said, he has many strengths that I do not have. We make unfair comparisons. And so if we begin to compare ourselves with the most extraordinary people, and we begin to compare ourselves with people who don't even exist, and we begin to make unfair comparisons, measuring our weaknesses against other people's strengths, then we won't have much to be, to be thankful for. Yesterday, when we were at Breaking Bread, the gentleman that founded that shared how after being in a ventilator with COVID, he was now thankful to have breath, and he was not taking it for granted. What a powerful reminder that we have so much to be thankful for that we take for granted every day. Today, as we continue looking at the book of Job, we see where Satan struck Job with painful physical disease. And yet in the midst of that, Job never lost his faith in God. He continued to worship and he continued to praise the Lord. Now, the amazing thing about Job is that the Bible reveals to us why he suffered what he suffered. It tells us why he lost his wealth, why he lost his children, and why he lost his health. In our own lives, we rarely, if ever, know why. When we experience a disaster or a calamity, the first question that most people have is, why? Why? They'll pray and they'll say, God, why is this happening to me? 
And there might be circumstances where we begin to see how this makes sense and God maybe even reveals to us why this could be happening in the moment. But most of the time, God doesn't give us any indication of why. And God doesn't give Job any indication either. You and I have knowledge today that Job did not have at that moment. And in a land that is so prosperous, we, we are... We were unbelievably prosperous. Maybe you don't feel prosperous today because you compare yourselves with the wealth of someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, and you say, well, I'm not a wealthy person. You look around the world where people are struggling just to find food to eat. You look around the world where people don't have uh, heating and air. Where they don't have access to great medical care. We look around the world and we begin to compare ourselves with other peoples and we realize in relationship to them that, that we are extremely blessed. And in the midst of our prosperity and blessing, uh, there has arisen something in the United States that, that I, I'm not aware of it being prominent anywhere else in the world. It's what we call the prosperity gospel where people teach that if you follow the Lord, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. The, the difficulty with that is that it doesn't line up with the experience of people all throughout the Bible or all throughout Christian history. We look at the apostles who, out of 12, not, not counting Judas, but Judas' replacement, Matthias, out of 12, as far as we know, John is the only one who died a natural death of old age. Everyone else was martyred for their faith. And that was the original 12. And then we see throughout history of people who were, were persecuted, who were faithful to the Lord. And we look around the world today and we see people in developing nations who are following the Lord with all their heart. And yet they live in the midst of disease and disaster and war. And we ask the question, how does that line up with this teaching that if we follow the Lord, we'll always be healthy, we'll always be wealthy? And it doesn't. And neither was the experience of Job. Job lost all of his wealth. He lost his children. And in the passage that we look in today, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we find where he loses his health as well. And God explains to us why all this happens and what is taking place. And so I want to ask you this question. Could it be that God might call us to difficulty for his glory? That's what happened in Job's life. And we look around the world and we see missionaries people who have left the comfort and convenience of America and exchanged prosperity for poverty in order to go and to serve in different places around the world. It's hard to say that they are not in the center of God's will, surely going to follow the Lord's call to pursue the Great Commission to the ends of the earth Surely, if anybody's in the center of God's will, it is they. And yet many of them today live in poverty and suffer. So could it be that there are times in life that God actually calls us, calls us to calamity? Whether that be humble financial circumstances or sickness or disease, that he might use it for some purpose. I want us to think about that question as we look at Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Would you join me in standing just out of reverence for God's word as we, as we read this together? Job chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless 
an upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Let's pray together. God, help us to understand why you might call somebody to suffer for your glory. May we be your servants. May we bless you with our lives and with our attitude. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I, I want us to understand today that there is more to this life than what we can see. There's more to this life than, than what we can see. The Bible teaches us that spirits, both good and bad, are real and present among us. The Bible says here in verse 1, in this passage we just read, again there was a day when the sons of God, that, that phrase is used throughout the Bible to talk about angels. We see it multiple times used that way. The sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. So when we think about this world, there's more than just what we can see. We know that God exists. And, and now, even though Job didn't necessarily know it, we know because of the New Testament that not only does, does God the Father exist, but God the Son exists. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to remain with us until he returns again. So there is more than just what we can see. You and I are more than just matter. We also have a soul. We have a spirit. And the Bible tells us that God created angels and that about a third of them rebelled against him. And so now we have spirits in the world who are at war with God. So there's more to this life than what we can simply see in front of us. And so we need to live with this, this awareness. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 gives us an example. In, in teaching about hospitality, here's what it says. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So the Bible says that we should not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And it says that some people in showing hospitality in strangers weren't even aware that the very people that they entertained were, were angels. So the Bible gives us multiple examples uh, throughout it, how angels live uh, um, and work among us, and sometimes they even appear in human form. And you may think you're talking to a person, and you're talking to an angel. You say, Pastor, I, that's really far fetched. I'm not sure if I believe that. And I, that's just what the Bible says. If you don't believe that, I encourage you to read the Bible some more. It teaches it very clearly. There are angels among us. There are demons among us. God exists. He is real. The Holy Spirit is here. There's more to life than what we can see. So, so we're not living in, in, in merely a material universe. We are living in a material universe. There's matter. God has created. But, but we're not merely living in a material universe. There's more than what we can see. And the Bible teaches us that there is a war being waged against God. So in verse 2, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. So the Bible tells us, and we looked at this passage the other week, that 
the world, this is Satan's domain where he is currently trying to wreak havoc in every way he can against God. And so as he goes before God, and God says, where have you, from where have you come? He says, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. He's, he's roaming with all of his demons to try to see how he can hurt God by hurting his children. There's a war that's being waged against God. I had a professor in seminary, a great pastor, great pastor, and, and when he was going through seminary himself, he was pastoring a church, and he got into a, a conflict with his church, and I, I don't have time to tell you that story this morning, but someday I hope I can, but he got, long story short, he got in conflict with his church, and one day his daughter came home from school, she was older, she came home from school and she had wet herself, and he said, what in the world happened? And she said, well, we had a substitute teacher today, and that substitute was a member of his church, and she intentionally would not let the girl go to the bathroom all day. She tried to hurt the pastor by hurting his daughter. Do you know that's what Satan wants to do to you? He wants to hurt God by hurting you. He wants to wreck your life, destroy your marriage, ruin your testimony. He wants to ruin your life. The Bible says here that he is at war against God. He's roaming the earth. In Ephesians chapter 6, that's what it says. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So the Bible tells us in Ephesians that you and I are the object of the devil's schemes. So there's more to this life than just what we can see before us. And when we live as though this is all there is, we have a very difficult time sometimes understanding and explaining difficulty in life, tragedy in life, suffering in life. And yet Job Job trusted God. And because he trusted God, he blessed God with his perseverance. Notice what it says in verse 3. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Listen to this. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Verses 1 through 3, until we get to that phrase there, he, he still holds fast his integrity. It's almost word for word what the Bible tells us in, in the first chapter about Satan going before God. He, Satan goes before God, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And Job says, and he says about Job, Satan says, well, he only worships you because you protect everything he has, and you bless everything. Take it all away, and he'll curse you to his face. And so God says, fine, just don't touch Job. And so Satan takes away everything he has, takes away his wealth, takes away his children. And the Bible says that, that Job fell down and worshiped God. And so Satan goes back before God. On another occasion, it says again, in verse 1, again. So it's a different occasion. He goes before God. And God, can, can you imagine uh, God, as he said this to Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? And in this moment, he says, he still holds fast his integrity. When we think about blessing, we almost always think about receiving a blessing from the Lord. But do you know that blessing is a two-way street? Have you ever thought about not just being blessed by the Lord, but you blessing the Lord? In Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, 
O you as angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. The Bible tells us here that angels bless God by their obedience. And then verse 21, bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Speaking again about all this great host of angels who serve God. They bless him by this. Then it says in verse 22, bless the Lord, all his works. The Bible tells us that creation blesses the Lord. And then, listen to the last part of verse 22. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Job, in this moment of utter loss, having lost his wealth, lost his family, he joined with the angels and all creation in blessing God by his response. So that Satan, who had said, well, if you take away what he has, he'll curse you to his face. He took away what he had, and Job fell down, and he worshiped. So that God can say now to Satan again, have you considered my servant Job? He still holds fast his integrity. There's more to life than what we can see. In every moment, it's not about what we receive in the moment. It's not about our comfort, our convenience, or our pleasure. There may be times in life when through our suffering and through our difficulty, we can bless the Lord by our worship through perseverance, even in difficult circumstances. So there's more to this life than what we can see, but there's also more to this life than just this moment. Yeah, I believe that Satan was counting on Job having a short view of life. And so in this moment, in verse 4, he says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. Life is more than a moment. And it's also more than the time that we'll spend on this earth. Uh, the Bible says that God has created us for eternity, and he's put eternity in our hearts. And yet many times we live as though this moment is all there is. Never thinking ahead to eternity, never thinking about storing up treasures, never thinking about blessing the Lord, never thinking about serving an eternal purpose, only thinking about just this moment. And when we get focused on just this moment, we'll become selfish, discontent, oftentimes disillusioned and confused. We experience the smallest little challenge or difficulty, and we say, why, Lord, is this happening to me? Satan said to God, he said, well, you, you take away his life, and he'll curse you to his face, skin for skin, all that a man has. Jesus told a parable about a man who had a very short view of life. It's recorded in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. Listen to what he says. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Now this passage is not a condemnation of wealth, or savings, or planning ahead. But listen to the next verse as Jesus explains the problem here. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus told this parable about a man who was living like this life is all there was. And so when his crops produced plentifully, he built these barns, he stored it all up, and he said, I've got enough to last me for a long, long time. I'm just going to sit back and eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, fool, this night your soul is going to be required of you. Had 
This man not only had material wealth, but had he also believed and trusted in God? Had he also laid up treasures in heaven, not just in barns? Then in this moment when his soul was required of him, it would not be a crisis or a calamity, but he would be going to a place that the Lord Jesus prepared for him. You see, when we live with a very short view of life, it leads us to confusion and distress. When we live as though this next moment or this next decade or this next four decades is all there is in life. Both in the immediate and in the eternal, God is in control. And so verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. This, this is the, the most comforting passage in, in all of this chapter of Job to see that God, even in this moment, when Satan is trying to do everything that he can to destroy the faith of Job, and he goes directly before God and asks God for permission and that ought to encourage you right there that he has to ask for permission. He asked for permission to be able to strike Job. And in this moment, God sets boundaries, one boundary after another. First, he says, fine, you can take his wealth, but don't touch Job. And now he says, you can touch Job, but don't take his life. God is in control. And so when we experience difficulty, whether it be sickness or disaster, we need to understand that God has not lost control. He is still able to guide us through to the eternal purpose for which he has created us. It may not be comfortable in the moment, but God wins in the end. In John chapter 10, listen to what Jesus said about the power of God to sustain us. In John 10, 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Listen to this. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. That includes Satan. He's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Satan comes before God and he says, Job only worships you because you protected him and blessed him. And God says, fine, you can take what he has, but don't touch him. That doesn't work. So Satan comes back and he says, he says, a man will give everything he has for his life. Strike him and he'll curse you to his face. And God says, fine, you can take his health, but don't touch, you can't take his life. God is in control all in the midst of this and God's purpose for Job was was long term there may have been suffering that he went through in the moment but God used him for his glory throughout eternity here we are today thousands of years later uh, Job was was early early in the Old Testament times so we're thousands of years later and still today people are being encouraged equipped and empowered for ministry because of the suffering of Job only God can take suffering and use it like that and so you and I we need to trust God even when we don't get an explanation like we have about the suffering of Job there's more to this life than this moment. There's also more to this life than just pleasure. Sometimes godly people suffer even when they're in the center of God's will. And so the Bible describes Job's suffering in verses 7 and 8. It says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. The Bible emphasizes to us that the suffering of Job was real. And maybe you're here today and you have some very real suffering. I'm not for a second trying to minimize that. Understanding that there's more to this life than what we can see. There's more to this life than this moment, and there's more to life than just always experiencing pleasure. It doesn't diminish our pain, but it does put it in perspective. You know, the Bible says that one day when we're mourning death as believers, we still mourn, but we don't mourn 
as those who have no hope. Sometimes following God means turning away from every other voice. We just get introduced to this idea in verse 9, which we'll see more as Job's friends come to speak to him later. But in verse 9, it says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Isn't it a good thing that God didn't say to Satan, Have you considered Job's wife? (laughs) She would not have passed this test. And yet, Job, in hearing this horrendous advice, is still faithful to the Lord. So we open the sermon today, I ask the question, could it be that God might call us to difficulty for his glory? So let me ask you this question as we close. If you knew God was going to lead you into calamity, would you still serve him? Listen to what Job says to his wife. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? That evil there is not referring to a moral quality, but disease, disaster. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I want to encourage you today not to put your faith in what you can see. There's there's more happening than what we can see. There's angels among us. There are demons among us. The Holy Spirit is within us. God is work around us. There's more than what we can see. I want to ask you to live for more than this moment. We're not going to cease to exist at the end of this year or at the end of this decade or when we're lowered into the ground. We're not going to cease to exist. There's more than just this moment. Life is more than pleasure. Certainly, Jesus said that he came that we could have life to the fullest. God wants us to have a good life. God wants to give us joy. Uh, Some of the, the greatest moments of my life had been when I was right in the middle of God's will, pursuing service that he called me to. God calls us at times to to great joy. But there might also be a time that God would call you to suffering, that God would call you to pain. It could be because he wants to use it to shape you. It could be that he wants to use it for a purpose that we just can't even understand or know. I don't know if you've read the whole book of Job, but at the end, Job demands an answer from God. And God does not give Job an answer. Job says, why is this happening to me? I demand to know. And God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God helps Job to understand that he is the creator And Job is the creation. And he does not have to tell us why. So I want to encourage you today to believe God, to trust him, and to follow him. Whether you fully understand or not. 